We love hip hop. Yeah, you see all that noise that you're hearing outside and stuff like that because we're in the middle of downtown, right? Mm-hmm. And I already have everything. I'm yeah. already starting my audio recording and stuff. I noise reduce or I yeah, do but noise to also give it the ambience. Yeah, to actually, oh. salute to the people in the listening audience. They don't hear a, a lot of that. Oh, they don't street noise and all that because okay. I do something called noise cancellation. Yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and and for for you as a as yeah. a man that works yeah. behind the boards, you yeah. understand what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, cancel DBs. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm definitely. Um, honored to be able to have a conversation with somebody who works behind the scenes as well as in front of the scene. Mm, you know what mm. I'm saying? So let's mm. let's get into it. Um, we back at it. You know, another interview about to go down over here. It's your boy Friday Ricky Tread, aka the interview master. And um, big salute to the sponsors, Astro Pink. If you know, you know. Check them out on their website, myastropink.com, or on their Instagram, the real Instagram, Astro underscore Pink. Or oh, and also for this episode here, and you know, for most of our episodes moving forward in the future, salute to our sponsors as well over there at Black, uh, sorry, Diamond Club. Okay, you can find them on Instagram at Diamond Club underscore nine oh five. They do delivery all over the city. They got edibles. They got all types of goodies for you: flour, tinctures. Hit them up. Let them know that We Love Hip Hop Boys sent you and they might give you a discount scene. So check them out. Diamond Club underscore 905. But um, um, I did an interview a few months ago. And actually, it wasn't even that long ago when I think about it. Maybe about a month ago with a legend in the, you know, hip hop and um, reggae culture, um, Snow. When I first met him, where did I meet him? I met him at a fight. I met him at a, a, at a party. I was outside fighting, beating people up mm. and singing. A lot of mercy. He said, are you Jamaican? <laughs> I said, no. Is your mother Jamaican? I said, no. Rather, we have an interview of him saying this out of his mouth, mm-hmm. saying, then I said, is your mother Jamaican? Is your father? If I tricked him into being, if he thought I was Jamaican, how do you have to teach me how to spit reggae? To be yeah. spit reggae if I already know and I'm I'm fooling you and you're Jamaican. Yeah. And you know, the interview is doing this thing. And you know, I, I was honored to do the interview and we spoke about a lot of different things in that interview, including the legendary song Informa, right? Song that everybody knows, Guinness Book of World's record for a reggae song by a non-Jamaican artist, right? I'm correct about that, right? Yes. Right? And, you know, I felt it was a really engaging conversation. And I went through my emails and I saw an email from this gentleman who said, I want to give my side of the story, right? So with no further ado, we have producer and DJ Marvin Prince in the building. What's up, yo? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm all right, man. Yeah, all man. Right. Thank you for coming through. Yes, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with you, especially after doing my research. I was like, wow, there's a, a lot of things that I think we're we need to unpack in this conversation. Here. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um let's start from the beginning with you and your history. Right. Right. Um you grew up in Jamaica. Yeah, I was born and growing. Right. And, and Jamaica. And what part of Jamaica? What city or town? Kingston 13, Delacree Road. Okay, okay, okay. And what was uh, life like growing up in Jamaica before leaving to come to Canada? Well, there was a more the political side, the JLP and the PMP and the killings and all that. That's why my parents left. Mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. came to Canada in 1980. Okay, okay. Right. And when you first moved here, right, in, in 1980, what was it like? Was it like, did you have a culture shock when you first moved here? Yeah, because everything I saw was white in the airport. Mm. The only time I saw that many white people was in movies. Yeah. On TV. All right. And then when I came out to the airport, the first thing that I saw was snow. And it was cold and it was unbearable. Mm. And when I was inhaling in and out, my nose, my nostrils stick together. 
That's crazy. But the snow was unbearable. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, you, you you came through and you you started, you know, living your life here in uh, mm. in Canada, right? When you first moved here into the GTA, was it um did you move from did you move to Scarborough first and then further out into the East End to Durham? No, we moved to Malvern. Well, Malvern was a plant. Uh, I'm from Empringham. Okay. Ten Empringham. So yeah. this is before it became the infamous right. Malvern. Right. Right. When Malvern was a plant, there was no mall. Just a community center. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, so what this is like preteens times. Yeah, I was thirteen. Okay. Twelve, thirteen. So what was life like around them times? You know, a lot of hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, the early electro funk, you know, the man parish, them, you know, um, freeze force, you understand, like those kind of guys, them, yeah. African Bombardo, you understand, Planet Patrol. That's what I grew up on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, you got into DJing at a young age. Right. Um, you had a Mickey Mouse turntable? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had a Mickey Mouse turntable. What? I I heard this in an interview, Salute to Muscle and, and yeah. the Two Line Music Hut, right? Over the yeah. Entertainment Report podcast. Great interview, mm. right? I heard the Mickey Mouse turntable. I'm like, what the hell is a Mickey Mouse turntable? <laughs> it was something I bought for $36. Okay. With my paper rope money. So you always always knew you wanted to be a DJ? I wanted to be a DJ because I saw Jam Master J scratching a rock box. Mm. And the sound just... I gravitated towards the sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm going to throw a name at you. Okay. UTFO, Roxanne, Mi Roxanne. Yeah, Mixed Master Ice. That's, a, that's another way I was um, DJing to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would go on my knees like a ninja and scratch. Yeah, yeah. So you got into t DJing and like turntableism at the same time as they call right. it now. Right. But right. you remember in the Muscle interview, I talk about my mother break the record. Mm-hmm. That was the UTFO record. Yeah, and <laughs> I guess was this because you guys had like a very sh like heavy Christian background, like church? Yeah, we're very Christian. Yeah. My brother is a pastor. He just got his PhD. Yes, okay. okay. <laughs> right, so. Yeah, dope, dope. Yeah. Yeah. So getting into the to DJing and stuff like that, was there any pushback? Yeah, because I'm doing something that wasn't Christian-like. Secular. Right. But then I, I grew up with my uncle when he came and lived with us. Right. And he was heavy into the Johnny Ringo, Lone Ranger and them kind of people. Mm -hmm. The Eka Mouse, the Yellow Man. And then when I went to Brooklyn, um, my uncle Bill Bruff, my godfather, he got me into doo -wop. He was a DJ. Yeah. Right. So he would give me doo -wop records. And then I tried to mix the doo -wop with the with the reggae mm -hmm. or with the hip hop. Okay. And it worked. Okay. And you know, you mentioned New York, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like New York is going to be popping up a lot of times oh, in, yes. in this story here. Yes. And you know, you started going to New York, like how you just explained, right? Mm -hmm. around, around when did you meet your son's mother? Because you, you mentioned that your son's mother right. was, was a rapper. I met her in 1987. Okay. 1987. Right, and she was already rapping at that time? Yeah, um, she was a model from New York. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, and her mom sent her up into Pickering to go to school. So she was going Dunbarton, and she was looking for a DJ. And some guys still knew about me, and they hooked us up. Yeah. So she was my first artist. Wow, wow. Yeah. So, you know, you started going around DJing for her? No, I was DJing, and she always told me, she go, you're nice on the turntables, but you got to see the guys in my neighborhood. Yeah. Right, I already knew I was nice, but when she said, see the guys in the neighborhood, I said, all right. And then I went down for March break mm -hmm. with her. And then she introduced me to all these DJs. And then I was just blown away. There's a guy named Philly Phil. Mm -hmm. Blew me away. Every day I had to go back and just watch him DJ, soak it in. Yeah. And come back and practice. So yeah. this, this helped you to, this inspired you to start sharpening your skills more? Yes, it did. Right. Yes, it did. And and you, you did. You know, while you're out there, you told a funny story. We have Onyx Barber over here. Yes. Okay. Just, Onyx just Barber. Down the road, yeah. Right down yeah. the road from, yeah, from the studio here. Yeah, right? Shooter and Young. 
However, you got your hair cut from members of Onyx, Onyx right. before they were rappers. Yeah. Fr- Fredro and Sticky Finger. Yeah, Fredro and Sticky Finger at New Tribe Barbershop. Okay. Uh, off of Jamaica Avenue on Guyar Brewer. When you met them when they were doing, uh, when they were barbering. Right. Did they even mention that they wanted to be rappers at this no. time? No. So they no. were just strictly, strictly barbers? Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. I knew Fredro when he had the big afro and yellow hair. Wow. Before he was even bald headed. Yo, salute mm. to, to Onyx. That's yeah. We love hip hop alumni. I've, I've interviewed yeah. them. So My good friend, uh, Shy Skills, was their producer. He's the one that was the DJ for them. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace, Shy Skills. So. Yeah. yeah. So as you, you continue to like make these connections down there, because to us in, in mm-hmm. over here in Canada, mm-hmm. getting those connections in the States is really important, especially back it's then. It's totally different because up here is a crab in a barrel mentality. Yes. Down there, everybody's trying to help you or they know someone who can help you and they hook you up with this person. The he hooks you up with uh, every, everybody's trying to hook up everybody. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? Up yeah. here, no, crab in a barrel mentality. Yeah. I brought um, Snow to Ivanbury at a barbecue. And he just laughed. He was like, no one cares about the white guy singing reggae. They didn't see the vision. Yeah. And, and I want to I wanna get to when you met Snow. But right. I want right. to, you know, I still want to build you as the, the producer, the right. DJ behind the scenes and the different right. attributes and things that you brought to the table before meeting Snow. Well, right? when I was 16, I met this guy named Ricky Tuffy. Okay. Right. Talk to me about that. He was that. dangerous on the mic. Right. And he was incredible because his cousin, his cousin Gandal is the one that brought him over to me. Mm-hmm. Right. Because since I DJ and I tested him and this kid went on, he did like four cassettes straight. Right. And I always wanted to work with him. But then the last time I saw him was down at Caravan in 96. Mm-hmm. And I said, Ricky, you seen what I've done? come in the studio with me, man. And we exchange number and say, Ricky, are you going to come? And he's like, he just nodded. And I was like, Ricky, I can make you something. And as I walked off about three minutes later, they killed him. Damn. R.I.P. Yeah. 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 I, I feel yeah. that you have an illustrious history prior to meeting Snow, right? Mm. Um, like even... Well... With- Especially in Jamaica, um, there was Jacob Miller when Jacob Miller died. Mm-hmm. That uh, that the procession by my grandfather's house of their Delca. He's from the area. Yeah, and and you, like in your neighborhood, like back then, like there was people like Yellow Man in your neighborhood and all types of. People. No, there was um, Yellow Man was near my school. Um, my dad, he knows more of them like Love and Dare and all of them people. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy from. Um, Bob Marley and Bonnie Whaler, Bonnie Whaler. my father, yeah. Wow, so yeah. like, I feel like it was destined for you to be in the music game. I think so, because um, one thing I never spoke about when I first came to Canada, and my mom brought me to a speech therapist because the Jamaican accent was really hard, mm-hmm. right? The lady that was there, she had a daughter that was adopted, and she was a model, so she'd be traveling all like Paris, and then when she comes down, me and her would sit down and talk. So I think she was about 16, 17. I was just 12. Yeah. Right? But she was just pretty. Right? Just to find out years later, um, the lady that adopted her, my tutor, uh, Mrs. Gibbs, Mm -hmm. that girl, her mother is five-time Grammy winner, Joni Mitchell. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy, yeah? Yeah, it's like... uh, It was there, yeah. A full circle or like a small world moment right there. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even with you with the production, Who the yeah. Cap Fit by Shinehead got yes. you in production. Yes. Uh, a Jamaican rapping on a reggae beat. Mm-hmm. Cause first there was Daddy Freddy, but he did it on She's Fly for Shantae. Yeah. With Ragamuffin hip, hip hop with Asher, with Asher D and them people. Yeah. Right? So, but when Shinehead did it, and then he was singing, chatting, and rapping which is my forte, mm-hmm. right? Because I have the junior read, the Eka Mouse, you know, the Yami Bolo. Them, there's my people. Yeah, yeah. That I listen to and I love that flow. 
And, the and He had that song back in the days. Um, no off the chat or or give me no crack. Give me no crack. crack yeah, give me right? no crack. Yeah, which was very hip hop influenced. This, yes. like, this is at the end times where it was starting to lean. Yes. Like, just quick, fast. Like, I feel like reggae and hip hop and or reggae even touching the mainstream mm-hmm. had a few like um, peaks. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. the early nineties, late eighties was one time. Like mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. you know reggae was starting to hit the forefront. Yes. Um, you know that's when um. These songs that we just spoke about, right. Shabba Ranks, all these guys were starting right. to get more right. mainstream notoriety, right. and then it kind of went down a bit. And then well, back in the days, hip hop used to follow the reggae, mm-hmm. the Just Ice, and all of them guys. Um, even Grand Puba Maxwell, yes, when he was with Master of Ceremony, right? So they used to, they were always following the reggae. It's just mm-hmm. that now everything flipped. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. The reggae now is following the the hip hop. So around that time, mm-hmm. you know, when hip hop and reggae were starting to make that marriage, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you can say, the f- this is around the time when you met Snow. Yes. Shout out to our sponsors, Astro Pink, always coming with that loud, loud. Check them out on their website, myastropink.com, or you can hit them up on Instagram at Astro underscore Pink. If you know, you know. Right? Yes. And the first song you produced for him was a song called Runway. Right. 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 So prior to that, tell me about the first meeting with Snow. Well, I met Snow um, off of Oak Street, off of Harwood in Ajax. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Outside of a nightclub. No, it wasn't a nightclub. It was a house party. Okay. I was going there to play. Now, my best friend, Tommy, got in a fight. Right, so I'm on the way walking, and then I also I said, "There's Black Bruce Lee, a kick up people," and then when I realized it was Tommy, well, it was Tommy and my friend Christian that was fighting these people. Mm-hmm. Then police break it up as we got there, and then Snow was there, but I did not know him. I didn't see him fighting that time. Right, right. So, so Tommy introduced me to him. I said, "My princess is Darren." Right. So while we're talking, Darren started cuss some badwood. In, in Jamaican, right? And I'm looking at it and I say, this is kind of weird, seeing a white guy, right? Then all of a sudden, um, I start singing. Mm-hmm. So I say, hold on, you, are you Jamaican? He says, no. I say, your mom and dad Jamaican? I say, no, right? And then he starts singing another song and then I told him, I'm a DJ. Yeah. So you sing reggae and all that, right? So I told him, come to my house tomorrow. You and Tommy come over, mm-hmm. right? That night I didn't sleep because I know I had hit the jackpot on something. Yeah. It was a gem. And that's how I came up with the name Snow, right? Stands for Superb Notorious Outrageous White Boy. Mm-hmm. So the next day he came over, he was shot because I was playing videotapes of regular artists he liked, but he's never seen them before. Right. But I had them on video. And then I had like clashes with Barry G against... Um, um, what that against Black Star and all them kind of stuff. And this is all from the tapes that you were getting from New York and stuff like that. No, this was this was a tape I got from my uncle Billy in Jamaica. Okay, he sent it up with my mom when she went down in eighty in eighty eight. Yeah, right. So I was playing playing it for him, and then every day we'll he'd come over and practice. So I'd be telling him, "No, don't say it like that. Give it more attitude. Don't say warm. Say warm. You understand? Like." Fine tune him, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Because he's saying that I'm I teach him reggae. No, I met him singing reggae. Yeah, right. it's just that when you're around me, you now you're gonna have a different attitude. Right, right. Like if you don't, if you're on the turntables and I'm teaching you, and I'm gonna teach you for, I'm gonna teach you for take off your clothes and put it back on. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so I'm gonna offer a little bit of pushback. Sure. Okay. Because through the interview that we did, mm-hmm. he said that he got his name, I guess, from his own hood. Mm. But right. you said an interview where 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 they asked him where he gets his name, and he said Prince gave me the name. Yes, that's on the Adrian Clarkson show. Yes, uh, and and I did watch um, the documentary piece that you sent me, and there was different footage from like right. old much music footage mm-hmm. with Christopher Williams and stuff like yeah, that. Michael um, Williams. Michael Williams. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like I was like, wow, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. right now he's trying to eliminate me out of the whole picture. Saying that he did it, not no Jamaican do it. He did it. 
Wow. But wow. you remember, that's what um, the Europeans did when they went to Africa and chop off the nose and stuff off the, off the images, right? Yeah. So. So, now, you guys had already recorded a few songs. Yes, Besides before. Runway, you had recorded a multitude of songs, including the beginning to inform us. Yes. Right? Yes. And. Those were demos. Right. Those were demos that was recorded from my house. And then I, when he went to jail and he came out to jail three days later, which was February the 20th, he came out to jail. Mm -hmm. February the 23rd, I took him to Calibi studio. That was 1990. Right. Right. Now, there was a time now you go to New York City mm -hmm. and. OK, actually, I want to make sure I get these timelines correct. Sure. OK, you guys record a demo of Informa and on it, on, the, on that in demo what's on it is the snow's first verse and then is the last verse from little red on there also or yes okay red? okay how about the informer came about please we did it on the stalag rhythm right he had we put the chorus on the first verse mm -hmm. then the second song we did it on the peeny peeny rhythm okay right it's a song that called they call me snow mm -hmm. on the third verse of that song it's on the second verse of Informer, right? Then the last verse of Informer now, which is um, Little Red's verse, come with a nice young lady and all that. Yeah. We did that at Goldfinger Studio. I brought him to Goldfinger Studio in New York. Mm -hmm. and Goldfinger was testing him. And then Snow said to me, what should I do? And I said, do come with a nice young lady. And he did it and I recorded it, mm. right? And when we met Shen, we had only the two verses. Right. So he said he wanted to use the last verse. Right. So he used the last verse, but we needed a third verse. So me and him write the third verse because I was listening to part um, Lectra um, at a dance hall. Right. It was Lectra with um, Major Mackerel. And I think the white boy Dominique was on that video. OK. Yeah. And, you know, there's the meeting of Shan here mm -hmm. at this point now that you have Informa and a bunch of other tracks recorded. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm and I'm. He's telling a totally different story. Well, I'm re-emphasizing a bunch right. of other tracks because, right. from the story that I received from the interview, mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna re go, we're gonna go through the, the story from right. the other side. Right. He met Shan, and he being Snow met Shan in Queens. They off he of sold Jamaica, him some weed off of Jamaica Avenue. Off all Jamaica black Avenue. all black people and only one white guy. Right. That make any sense? I understand. <laughs> Okay, and then I'm just retelling the story that yeah. that Snow told on on the platform here. Mm. Okay, and then from there they started recording and they recorded the whole Informa album or the album um, um, Twelve Inches of Snow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Give me your recollection of the story because I also have different pieces where I have Shan saying I met Prince, his right. DJ, right? Right. So you right. guys were together there on Jamaica Ave. So let me explain what happened. Um, I went to, I was playing my demo of Informer mm -hmm. at Music Factory. It's a record store off of Jamaica Avenue in the Coliseum. Okay. Right? I was playing for a guy named Walt. Walt is the manager for Black Moon. Yes, Mr. Walt. Right. Um, his brother is Evil D. So when I was playing the song, I looked over at the side and I saw a guy dancing to it while he's looking through records, right? So when, when the song finished, Walt said, yo, I like, I like, I like the informer song. The guy tapped me and said, yo, is that your stuff? And I said, yes. And when I looked, it was Q-Tip from A Tribe Called Quest. Yeah, abstract. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he hooked me up with um, a lady from Def Jam. So. I called her where um, she hooked me like three weeks later. So I came back to Canada, did some more demos with Snow, mm -hmm. came down now, came back to New York, see my son's mother. On my way to Def Jam, I said, let me stop over the studio, Goldfinger Studio, mm -hmm. right? And I, to tell Goldfinger, yo, I'm going to Def Jam. While I was there, Large Professor was there, right? And they were talking. And I kept looking at this guy because he kept looking at me. I said, boy, this guy looks so familiar. Yeah. Right? Like him to have on a dingy white shirt, 
right? And and two different pumas, but it never clicked in, right? It's until when he told Finger, he said, see you later, Finger, because Finger did ignore him, right? And him walking out, while I'm walking away, the back of his shirt said MC Shine. It was faded, faded red that it's now pink. Mm -hmm. Big salute to our sponsors, Diamond Club Delivery. They got delivery all over the GTA and a crazy selection of flowers, tinctures, edibles, and everything that you need. You can also check them out on the 7 Days of Weed website, s7daw.com. Or you can check them out on their Instagram, Diamond Club underscore 905. Mm. Right? And that's when I went on that whole shine about snow. Yeah. And while I'm telling him about snow, Right? I said, Finger, tell Shan about so. And they were like, yeah, man, the white boy bad. Mm -hmm. Him bad, him bad. But the way how he's talking it, Shan no know says a white boy because we're talking as yard man. Yeah, bring your mic over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, as, we're talking as, as a yard man, right? So. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah. No, you're good. no it's all right. Yeah. It's all right. No. Yeah. Keep going. All right? So, so from there, sir. So, Shine goes, if he's that good, let me hear him. Mm. Right? I said, well, he's in Canada. Shine say, how soon you can get him here? I said, within about two days from now. So right. Shine give me his number. So, so well, I, I okay. had to convince my son mother now, because my son wasn't born yet. Right? So I had to convince her and say, listen, you see the money that, because I did get some OSAP money, so I pay off my school. Yeah. But, you know, they give you enough to live on. So I said, the money for the crib. I need to bring snow down here. And then she'll kick off, no, I'm blah, 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 right? And I said, trust me, I believe in this. Mm -hmm. I believe it would happen. And she let me send the money to him. Yeah. He came down, I phoned Shan, I said, he's here. Shan said, let's meet at Goldfinger Studio. So when we got to the studio, Shan was there with a guy named um, Edmund Leary. Okay. But the studio was locked. So then was just sitting outside by, there was a little patty shop beside, beside the studio that Goldfinger owned. And then that's when I told Shan, this is him and all that. And Shan said, well, let me hear you. And then Snow asked me, what should I sing for him? I said, do color me bad. He did, I want to sex you up. Then I said, do loot of Andrew. And then, because I can mimic. Mm -hmm. And then Shan was like, okay, okay. I said, well, Snow, well, do informal. And as soon as I'm doing Pharma, it was over. Yeah. It was over. So we started recording the demos now, real demos now, at Shan's house. Okay. Right. And then Shan took it to, to our managers at the time. Well, they weren't our managers at the time. He took us to the managers, and then one of them had a studio. And that's where we did all the recording, Bayside Studio. And and to be clear with the managers, like mm. these were people that Shan was already working with at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shan knew them really well. Right? Because Shan started a record company shortly after um, linking up with you guys. It was more a production company. Okay. But the production company was more Edmund Leary. Interesting. Edmund Leary was the keyboardist on the whole, on the whole album. Mm-hmm. The R and B songs, Edmund Leary wrote those. Right. It's just that to never get the financial part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because we're all still new and we're still young. He was also new. Right, right. The chatting part, that's me and some because I love chatting. I love the rapping stuff. Yeah. Right. So basically for the album, mm -hmm. for the lyrical content of the album. Right. It's a product of you producing lyrics or creating lyrics and right. then giving them to Snow to perform? Yeah. Or are you guys doing references and then he's just redoing the references? No. Okay. My, all the songs that Snow was doing was done in Canada. All the chat and stuff. Okay. Was done in Canada. So when he's doing it in front of Shan, Shan's like, oh, wow. Incredible. Mm -hmm. But Shan didn't even know the history. Is when... um. Is when um, my little brother here and my other brother, they saw the, the, the cover and wasn't credited because um, they had just did the printing. And when I talked to the manager on their own, I was like, yo, Steve, why is my name isn't here for the song? Right. And he was like, what are you talking about? All right. I said, my name's not here. Me and, me and Snow did this. Mm -hmm. 
right? And then when he talked to Shan, because Shan was there, we were just mixing the album. Shan said, oh, he always thought it was just snow. Wow. Right? So snow called in that night from jail because mm-hmm. he was at Maplehurst. Right and and, and that was a, that was a separate that was a separate charge. This is charge. after the attempted murder. Uh, yeah, that this was, was after like the assault attempted, charge. Yeah, right. he was on an assault charge, and then Steve Salem, the manager, said, "Hey, um, Prince been telling me he wrote these songs and blah blah blah." And Snow was like, "Yeah, why? What's wrong? What's the problem?" Mm-hmm. All right, and they were like, "Oh, we already doing printed and stuff." So they'll compensate me. They'll give me a contract so I could get my publishing and all that. Right. I did not know what publishing was. Did you ever receive a contract in yes. the beginning? Yes, I did. No. Um, I received a contract for the songs. But in the beginning, we had received a recording contract and a management contract right. from the manager. So what you have to understand, the managers own the record label. Mm-hmm. Which is the conflict of interest, but keep going. Right. That's what Jam Master J told me. Mm-hmm. Right. R.I.P. So, so what happened now is that when they gave us a contract, Snow's mom was saying, well, she knows lawyers because him always in the trouble. I do not know no lawyers. I'm, I'm never been in trouble. Right. Right. And from there, that's the last time we saw the contract. So Snow's lawyers took care of the con of, what the contracts were supposed no, to be. No, it looked like the managers got him a lawyer. Hmm. All right. And whatever happened behind the scenes. Because we were trying to rush everything before he went to jail, the album and everything. Right. All right. So, so he signed something before going to jail. Yes, because in court it came out, he signed in, I think, June 1992. Uh, June 1992. And I think the managers in January 1991. And when he signed the, the one in 1991, no, sorry, January 1992, January 1992, um, I was at school doing my exams. Mm-hmm. I was at Seneca doing my exam because as soon as I finished my exam, I came down. Right. Because he was already down there recording. So it looked like they went and did some talking with him behind. And then some money was passed. Because he got a, a huge advancement from them. How much? $20,000. So, all this happens. Right. And then the songs, and this is the song, then the song takes off. Right. And so, so the first time I asked about the contract, the manager was like, Prince, he's in jail. Well, what can we do? Right. Then as soon as he came out, we started traveling within a week. Right. And I was asked, I still asked about the contract and they were like, oh, when the tour slows down, because we yes. were going all over the world. Right. It's, it's when, it's when everything stopped now, when he got banned mm. and we were in Jamaica and we did reggae sunsplash. And I seen with all these American money and I said, where you get this money from? Yeah. And he said, oh, the manager for the show. I said, so where's my money? Right. And then when I talk to the manager, they say, you have to talk to the accountant, the accountant. I talk to the accountant, they send me to another person, and I realize I get in a running around. Mm. Right? And you're saying that you're touring all these different countries and they're not paying you per, per city? No, what they would do is um, we were going to like the fanciest restaurants, the fanciest um, hotels. Mm-hmm. So you really don't need any money because I say, listen, I want that shirt. They go and buy it. Right. I oh, want these shoes. They went and buy it. Right? So there wasn't really anything that, that we'd need. It's just when the tour stopped. And then what got fishy was when I asked Snow about the contract again, when he's in my driveway, he got the managers to call, call and then he came a few days later back to my house and he presented me with a contract. Mm-hmm. But the contract was only for runway. <laughs> Mm. Right? I said, what about the other songs? He said, oh, they said it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Right? And then when my father read the contract, my father said, you're going to need a lawyer on it. So I got in touch with Clive Davis's daughter. Okay. All right? And she said, Prince, I need you in my office ASAP because I had faxed it to her. Mm-hmm. And she said, you see the, how it sounds all nice and all that? At the end of it, you get $1. Wow. If you sign it. 
So you obviously never signed the no, contract. No, I never signed it. That's what also helped save me in court. Right. Because they were trying to say that they don't know me. Snow was even saying the same thing. They, that they didn't know you? Yeah, they didn't know me. They did not know who I was. But you're in the music videos. I know. Wow, wow. And I'm on every interview for the first album. Because they were all fascinated. How did this black guy find this white guy that sings reggae? So, how long did the tour go on for? Like the world tour? It went on for a year. Over a year. No, no, over, for, over a year. Over a year. Yeah. And you're around what age at this time? I was 21. Wow, you're super young. Uh, yeah. So you guys come off tour. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that starts making you really realize, besides being on tour this whole time and not, you know, the contract and everything like that. Mm. Realizing that you know this might be a one-sided deal is when you see Snow pull up in a Pathfinder. Right, right. I was walking with my son. I borrowed fifty dollars from my father. Wow. And I, I was taking him to Payless. So I walking over to Payless, and I had my son on my shoulder, and Snow pull up in a Pathfinder. And I said, "Where you get this from?" Mm. He's like, "Oh, he got his money and all this." I said, "So where's my money?" Oh, it's coming. Yeah. Right. It was always it's coming. It's coming. All right. So, and then I just dropped the lawsuit on him. And this is a lawsuit that you decided um, to sue Foreign Pharma and other songs. Is it no, just Foreign Pharma? We're suing for the, I was suing the partnership and I was suing the management. Right. The managers. So you weren't suing Snow directly? No, I was suing him directly also, but I okay. was also suing the, suing the managers then. And this is for $5 million that you were suing him for? No, at the time. no, it was five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand. Yeah, five hundred thousand. That's what my lawyer was asking for in court. So, where do I have that? You want a settlement via the jury for one point five million? Right. So, what happened now? My lawyer had asked the jury for five hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. Right. The jury had come back to the judge and they had asked a question. I wasn't paying attention right. to that. Right. And the judge says, too excessive. I never know what they were talking about. As after was when the jury came back in, they made a decision in like 45 minutes. Right. Right? And they said, we're rewarding, we're, we're awarding Marvin Prince 1.5 million, not 500,000. Right? And it was after the jury left, I was downstairs in the lobby, and the jury members came up to me and said, we were awarding you $20 million. But the managers, um, the, the case against the managers got thrown out. And it got thrown out because I didn't have the contract. And the managers are saying, there's no contract. Mm. Right? So that got dropped. Or I would have gotten 20 million, they said. Wow. So they gave me what Snow have. So what did you get out of that case? Monetarily? I got four t-shirts, different colors. So you got zero dollars out of zero. the case. I got zero. Wow. Because what happened, um, I said that another, I think a muscle interview was eight months later, but it wasn't eight months. It was 18 months later. Mm-hmm. Look, I, before I came here, I looked through some of the court documents and it was 18 months later, the judge came back with and threw out the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. During that time, mm-hmm. you're waiting for 1.5 million waiting, to come right. in? I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Are you making plans ahead of time? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. That's crazy. Because one of them, I was going to quit the whole music business. Okay. And I was going to buy a pickup truck, go around garbage day, around the nice area suburbs, mm-hmm. take up the, the couches and stuff, repair them, and send it back to Jamaica and set, um, um, open a second-hand shop. Mm. Plus, I wanted to open a White Castles at Young and, Young and Dundas. White Castles in Toronto? Holy, yeah. oh, hey, I don't know if we can handle those burgers, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's crazy. So, so the whole time, that's my vision. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Yeah. So at some point in time, you guys do see each other again. Well, during the, during the lawsuit, I did see him yes. for the first time because he tried to get me to 
to stop the lawsuit. So he brought Ninja Man to my hotel. Okay. So tell me about that interaction. Well, when I saw Ninja, when, when he told me... And, and just to, for people who don't know, because we are a hip-hop network. Right. Ninja Man, is notorious, the notorious. <laughs> right. okay, gangster slash dancehall artist, mm-hmm. okay, um, I think it was Sting, when him and Super Cat were going back and right. forth, and then mm-hmm. a gun came gun out, and all out, types yeah. of shit, like, yeah. these guys are the real deal, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So when you see Ninja Man with them long red eyes and things yeah. like that, like, it yeah. might be a problem. Yes. Go. So, he knock on my hotel door, I opened the door, I was like, what's up? He was like, yo, we need to talk to you. So I said, okay. I came out. And then also some man them start opening the exit door and they start walk and stand up. Mm. About 40 of them, because I'm, I'm counting everybody. That's crazy. Right? And I was like, what's this there? And he's like, oh, I just come for talk to you about the last one. Next thing I see, Ninja Man come up. Right? And when Ninja Man came out, Ninja Man was looking at the wall. The wall was all white. And I was like, damn, he's coked out. That's what I'm saying, mm-hmm. right? And I said, Darren, this is kind of corny. And he was like, what are you talking about? You remember I'm Jamaican? And he was like, and? All right, watch this, Darren. Desmond, and Ninja Man turned around. I said, well, I'm Desmond. You see my uncle this morning? And he was like, who's your uncle? I said, Desi Young. He said, Desi, are your uncle? Yeah, he paid me this morning for the show and all that. And him come hug me up and all that. He said, Desi, are your uncle? Mm-hmm. And then I look at Snow and I just I say, you understand? And I just went back in my room. Crazy. And just left it as that. Wow, wow. Yeah. Um, I want to go back a little bit in the story. Well, sure. You guys, when you were recording the songs and stuff in Shan's crib, mm-hmm. okay, I don't think it's a secret when it comes to this hip hop game that Shan didn't have the best luck um, as far as his success in no, the game. No, Shan was financially, spiritually, mentally bankrupt. There was roaches falling all over the place in the studio? Over 3,000. What the heck? I never drank beer until that, until I went to Shan's house. Wow. Right? And this is after the symphony and, uh, and oh, yeah, the this is over the, and everything. That Those songs, no, we, it, the only reason we knew Shad is because of these things. It was after the Beat Biter, Molly Scratch, um, The Bridge. Yeah. You understand? Left Me Lonely, right? All mm. those hits. Born to Be Wild. And, but he had nothing. Nothing. And the roach, him just a fall off. You know, you think the roach all a fall in your box and the roach I say you want to fuck me and say no you understand so it's taking over mm, mm. I asked that to ask what was the situation post informal coming out what do you mean cause you go into a crib slash studio with 3,000 roaches all over the place mm. now he catches a lick right He's on a song attitude. that's on in the Guinness Book of Worlds, right. a diamond selling single right. that he has a verse on that mm-hmm. apparently he didn't write his verse. No, his wife did. Terry did. Terry wrote the verse. Yikes. Yeah, Terry, his ex-wife wrote the verse. So Shan is like one of the early, early ghost, ghost written, yeah. or, <laughs> I don't know what to call the ghost yeah. writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Right? But I, do you think that this was his opportunity to get out of his situation? Yes, it was. It was. Because when he met Snow, he knew what to do. Jackpot. Yeah, because I feel like, and with all, I don't know, I don't even know how to say when it comes to like this whole Shan situation, Mm -hmm. when, if to add up with all due respect in front of it, Mm -hmm. but like, I feel like he's seen a situation and like a label started or like a, a production company started posted post this yes because yes. it's like now i have somewhere to, like i now i need an outlet to be able to put this out yes and he had the outlet he had the managers mm. right because steve salem he was the manager for lisa lisa and the cult jam um utfo mm-hmm. um full force cheryl pepsi riley Right, David Ng, the other manager, he had Bayside Studio. Ozzy Osbourne and all of them record there. Yeah. Salt and Pepper, Kid and Play, Kwame. Right. Wow. 
So they had their connection. Yeah, yeah. So they went and got a distribution deal for them. So Snow signed to them, right? And they got distribution for them. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So this the song gets what it gets, right? Let's fast mm-hmm. forward a little bit. Okay. The song goes on to make history. Right. Okay. Um, you get kind of cut, you get cut out, not kind of, you get cut out the whole situation. I right, walked from away from it. You're, you walked away from it. Yeah, I walked right? away from it. And post the, the, the court proceedings and everything like mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. you go back to your life dealing right. with what you deal with. Right. 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 There is a time that you and Snow do meet again. Yes, we met, um, I think it was 2015. I was with Chip Fu. God, Chip had a performance to do for one of the starting from scratch shows. Mm-hmm. Right? And before you get to that story, mm. did you and Chip, um, Chip Fu from the legendary Fushnikins, <laughs> yes. did you guys meet around them times, like early in those, those years? No. You y'all you met Chip Fu later on. I met Chip Fu later on, and okay. it's weird because Chip does what I do: mm. sing, chat, and rap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I met him in Pickering, right? So at a friend's house. Okay. Right, and that's how we hooked up from there. Dope. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Chip Fu. Yeah. So you and Chip Fu are together. Twenty fifteen. You mm-hmm. bump into Snow. Tell us a story from what happens there. Well, I was talking to Chip Fu. And then Chip said, look, and when I look, I saw Snow and he was looking at me and he come over and saw hugged me up. And he was like, you know, I had a dream about you last night. Mm. And I said, oh, your conscience will take you. <laughs> All right. And then he starts telling me, I was on a roof, I was falling off and you were pulling, you grabbed me and you were pulling me back up. Yeah. And, I said, and I said, Darren, that's not me. He goes, no, no, no. You were pulling me back up in the dream. I said, no, it couldn't be me because I would have let you go. Mm. Right. Right then, a guy come around the corner and he introduced him to me. That's his manager, this new manager. And he said, this is Prince I tell you about. And he said, tell Prince what I told you this morning. And the man told me the same story. Yeah. All right. So that was the only time that was it. Wow. This is, uh-huh. a, it's, it's such a wild story because I feel like, you know, fresh off of the heels of just interviewing Stone mm. myself and like just watching other interviews, like your name doesn't get included in the story. Right. Why do you think that Snow pretty much for the most part erased your name out of the history of his story? Because it was either the managers told him that, mm-hmm. right? Or he's just doing it because you remember, and I can say it, and it's not defamation of character, Right. He always um, self-professed um, professed that he's a con man, mm. right? Convict. He's an ex-convict. What do convicts do? Manipulate people. Yeah. Right? Make you believe their lies. But, but the problem is, it keeps, every time I lie, my name keeps surfacing somewhere. You always. guys never had a falling out at some point, let's say on tour or no, anything no, like no. that, where no. like you can no. start seeing like this is going to start going left? Like there was no, no red flags or anything along the way? No, the only thing I always thought he was going to get killed. Because he kept going in and getting into all these different fights and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then when he gets into these fights, I have to either protect him or the where the security. He quit. He said, no, this guy going to get me killed. Yeah. Right. Wow. But it was always, if you look, I have a big criminal history. Look at my history. My history is school books. Yeah. I'm in no trouble with no law. Right. So. So what was your thoughts when the song got a resurgence off of the Daddy Yankee remake? You know, even though I didn't get my money. I felt really sorry for Reds mm. because no on Daddy Yankee's part use Reds lyrics, come with a nice young lady. Reds is in Jamaica struggling. Mm. Right? While Emma beat off for money. Yeah, because he's completely, completely left out of the story. Little, li- little Red. Yeah, Little Reds. Yeah. Little Reds even have another song on the album called Lady with the Red Dress On. Mm. That's Red's song. That was Red's song. Reds always sing that song. Lady with the red dress on. 
I'm going to give you my opinion on sure. this right here of what I feel is this a, uh, this might be a mix of. Mm. The reggae industry, it was always very green to the business part of the stuff. Very much so. Right? right. Where right. even the hip hop industry was too, but they got hit the game earlier than the reggae industry. Yeah, they did. Especially right. with the whole rhythms and everything mm-hmm, like that. There's mm-hmm. a very gray area in that. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people could be huge off of a rhythm in Jamaica right. and not have the re- and, and not have the recognition over here in the States. Right. The songs are running in the dance hall. Right. No royalties. No royalties. Right. <laughs> well, there is royalties, but the producer gets royalties. But the artists who the are artists making a song get, big the, on this rhythm are not right. getting no, nothing. No, they don't get nothing. No. You know what I'm saying? No. Unless they do a dub plate for somebody or a something. A dub plate or you do a stage show. Exactly. Right. Right? Right. So the business end of the reggae scene has always been kind of murky. Yeah, it's backwards. Right? On the, And now on the hip-hop side, mm-hmm. as hip-hop started to evolve... The DJ started to get pushed out of the picture. Yes, they did. Right. Okay, right. you get where I'm going yes, here? Yes, yeah, I know where you're going. It was right. Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. Right. Eric B. and Rakim. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Until yeah. it became Will Smith. Right. Rakim. Rakim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Am, right. I, am I wrong about these things? No, you're like, right. We can see mm-hmm. the evolution of these things. Right. I feel that this might have been a bit of both. Yes. Yes. What the managers, what they did was they pushed the white guy forward and the black guy backwards. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll give you the perfect example. When we first met the managers, right? Um, Snow was bragging about his criminal past, I'm good jail, I'm good, blah, blah. And now, when they asked me now, right? They, first thing they asked me, how much convictions do you have? Yeah. I said, I don't have none. They were like, what? I said, no, I'm in college right now. Right? And they're like, what do you mean? I said, I'm in college. My mom, she works in the bank in the mortgage department. My dad's a computer programmer, analyst, consultant. Mm-hmm. And they were like, oh, you're a Cosby kid. Right? And that's where I was like, oh, okay, I see how white people view black people. Yeah. Especially down in the United States. Like. Especially in the United States. That's why yeah. I was shocked when the jury came back because it was all white jury. Right? Yeah. What they, saw, they saw right through it. Yeah. But you still didn't end up getting it. End still day, didn't, right? no. No. <laughs> so, but it makes a good story. Yeah. So fast forward, even like with you and Chip Fu, mm-hmm. you guys started working, you know, helping kids get back into school through hip hop. Yeah. We have a program called Math. So right? tell us about that. It's um, Math, Music Appreciation, Art Times Healing. Mm-hmm. So we're going to the school and we teach turntablism, songwriting, how to use your voice teach beat production, how to count the bars, them and all those kind of stuff. Yeah. And how you can do it without the record company. Mm-hmm. Right? Because really and truly, you don't need the record company. Right? So. Especially in these days and times. In, I'm talking these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You really don't. You can set up your own shows just off of the internet. Back in our days, we couldn't do that. So. As a DJ, I had to carry crates of records. Mm-hmm. Now I got 40,000 songs on this laptop. Yeah. Now you could just run the Serato and how, right. how people are That's just it. Right. plugging in their set and acting like they're doing it. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Yo, Marvin Prince, you have a very engaging story here. I feel that it was <laughs> necessary that people hear this. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you. I'm not going to lie, when I first got the email, I was like, oh, man, this is going to be 